So what I want to talk about is we've done a lot of great things and we can do better. So I'm the founder of the Level Playing Field Institute, which is a nonprofit, and I'll tell you about some of our programs there. Uh, and as you heard, I'm also a partner in Cape Or Capital, and we invest in tech startups with social impact. So let's get going. What does this look like? Is this some of the uh, mafia that Vivek was <laughs> talking about? Is this just another programmer culture that's looking for a billion dollar exit to all the usual suspects? With the woman there, yeah, there's the token. That's <laughs> <laughs> and then, what if it looked like this? What if America really was a meritocracy? Silicon Valley talks about being the most meritocratic place on the planet. And as Vivek told you, nothing could be farther from the truth. It's all about pattern recognition. So how are we going to work on that? How do we get to that meritocracy? What's in the way? So one of the things I want to talk to you about is all those biases and stereotypes that become barriers. So in the last few months, uh, three different men at three different conferences have said the following kinds of things when asked specifically about their funding of women entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs of color. One of these took place to, at the Latino 2 uh, startup conference. So here's somebody addressing um, a room full of Latino entrepreneurs, and he says, I'm colorblind. One was somebody addressing something called the Platform Summit, which was getting, uh, they were nicknamed it uh, the TED Conference for Black and Brown People. Um, and so a partner at a top tier Sand Hill Road VC firm looks out at that audience and says, well, I don't really care if you happen to be black or brown. Oh, he said African-American or Latino. So tell me this. How does somebody just happen to be African-American or Latino? <laughs> How do you just happen to be a woman, right? And that doesn't bother him. Isn't that big of him? Um, or bigoted of him, I'm not sure <laughs> which. Um, the third was of one of the top tier accelerators, often known as the Harvard of accelerators, said, I don't fund CEOs with accents. And then when challenged, defended it. It's like, really? And now what part of a meritocracy does this fit into? These are the last half of 2013 in the heart of Silicon Valley. Saying, if you don't make it, it's because something's wrong with you, you didn't lean the right way or something, is, how about that Facebook quote that Vivek got about being victims? This isn't about being victims. These are about real live biases and barriers that need to be called out. So I'd love to hire more. It's a pipeline problem. I'm not biased. I only want to hire the most qualified. Vivek's been told, no affirmative action, no quotas. Just send me qualified candidates. They, whoever they is, are unlikely to fit with our company culture. How, you know? One of uh, an entrepreneur who came to pitch us said, when we commented on the fact that he had no women on his team, and he said, well, you know, we all live together, and we like to drink a lot of beer, and I just don't think it would work out. <laughs> and we decided his company's not going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> So, how about this one? People who work here, we all have to make tough choices. This is 24-7. This has got to pick your priorities and can't have a personal life and all that. So all of us have heard these things. And people really believe that these are merit-based objective statements. We need to keep calling out that they aren't. But you know what? All of these that we've all heard directed at women, at affluent white women, 
Some of us also utter these phrases when we talk about our sisters and brothers of color. What do we do? Just think about what would happen, it gives me chills, if we all teamed up and said no more of this about any of us and interrupted those comments every time we heard them, no matter what group they were all about. Many of you might have heard about this study, famous study, very methodologically rigorous, four resumes matched for education and experience, and they had different names. Two economists, um, they were sent in to real jobs in the Chicago area and the Boston area. They were posted both online and in, in print papers when print papers existed a few years ago. And here are the four names that were at the top of those resumes. Emily Walsh, Greg Baker, Lakeisha Washington, Jamal Jones. This appears in a peer-reviewed, very prestigious economics journal. Who gets the callbacks? <laughs> Emily and Greg. No gender difference here. What's really interesting is that one of the authors of this study uh, Mullen Nathan, who then was at MIT and is now, uh, the first author here is Marianne Bertrand. So it's a man and a woman doing the study together. The second author who was at MIT is now at Harvard. And he said, when he proposed this study, his well-meaning colleague said, are you sure you want to do this? Because you know what you're going to prove. You're going to prove how much unfair advantage minorities now have in the workplace. <laughs> So talk about the assumptions versus the reality and how we need to close that gap. So this one just uh, was reported out. It's not even published yet. It just appeared a few weeks ago. A uh, woman Harvard Business School study uh, professor did the study. And she took a real live startup that had been recently funded. So we know it's an investable idea did a video pitch and sent it around to a bunch of prominent VCs. The only difference, one had a male narrator and one version had a female narrator. So we know already it's an investable proposition. Somebody's already written checks for it. What do you think happens now? To that perfect heart of meritocracy here in Silicon Valley, oops. 40% is a rather significant difference. Having nothing different in that pitch deck but a female voice versus a male voice. What meritocracy? So what's our problem here? I think we have a two-pronged problem. People always talk about, oh, it's a pipeline problem. Fewer women studying computer science. I have nothing to do with it. If I had those talented, qualified applicants, I'd hire them. We do have a pipeline problem, and I am going to talk about what we and many other people are doing about that. We also have a leaky pipeline problem, and that leaky pipeline problem has everything to do with biases and barriers, ways in which some people are kind of moved on out, hit glass ceilings, lucite ceilings, glass walls, insurmountable obstacles. So here are five young women who give me huge hope for the future. And there are hundreds more just like them in the SMASH Academy, the Summer Math and Science Honors Academy run by the Level Playing Field Institute, which is the nonprofit that I started. Uh, SMASH just finished its 10th summer. High school kids, all low income, uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch level of low income. Uh, almost all, 90 plus percent, will be the first in their families to go to college. They come all three summers of high school. They live in the dorm here in the Bay Area. It's either Berkeley or Stanford. Southern California, it's either UCLA or USC. And they study tech. They study entrepreneurship. They study math. They study science. They have project-based learning. They have uh, RAs who went through the program a few years ago and now are in top colleges. So these kids are now in college. First of all, 100% graduate high school and 100% get accepted to four-year universities. Now, um, 
I will pass that on because whenever, whenever anyone gives me credit, I say, you know what? I haven't taken one of their exams and I haven't written one of their papers. All we do is move the boulders out of the way that never should have been there in the first place. They do all the hard work. We have several kids who are now at MIT. We have several more applying. We've got, and they'd never heard of MIT when they started um, three, four years ago. We've got kids at Middlebury. I say, you've got to be kidding. You've never been on an airplane, and do you know how cold it is in Middlebury? Um, and then I asked the admissions officer when, when our first kid, probably seven years ago now, he's already graduated, got into Middlebury, and I said, so tell me, do you have uh, African-American hair care products in your student store? Where are our kids going to go get their hair cut? And literally, her mouth dropped it. Never thought about it. But all of the kids who've gone to Middlebury have graduated. All the kids who've gone to MIT. This year, as we speak, we have two girls as freshmen at Harvard. Hasn't happened before. Yes. <laughs> Vivek was the instigator. Is that the best word? At one of our events, more the inspiration and instigator, the, uh, the double I. At one of our events a year ago about giving low-cost tablets to low-income kids here in this country. So in the past couple of months, we ran two hackathons, served 250 low-income kids of color, at least half girls. Each one of them got a low-cost tablet for free. Silicon Valley Bank was one of the funders. AT&T provided three months of one gig. Um, and we got lots of people to donate software. And we had judges serious serial entrepreneurs and VCs come do the judging. They got cash prizes for that. We're staying in touch with the kids. Their challenge was to solve a real problem in their school or community. It was unbelievably inspiring and heartbreaking. And you can ask Vivek or me about it at, at the break. A, an all-girls team from Black Girls Code uh, came up with an app to confront bullying. And part of it was to let the bullies know their bullies. One of the apps was how to walk home from school safely, which gangs are active on which streets today. So if you think about obstacles, think about the obstacles these kids in our own backyards face all the time. And I want to applaud Heather for her message. We don't have to take a plane very far. We can travel a very few miles um, to help kids who need the same kinds of just a fair opportunity. They don't need anything more. They don't need any unfair advantage. They need the unfair disadvantage taken out of their way. So lots of groups are cultivating the pipeline, Focus 100, the Pipeline Fellowship, Women 2.0, New Me, Lautism. There are just all kinds of groups springing up to help women entrepreneurs from all backgrounds to help entrepreneurs of color. So then what happens? At Cape Or Capital, we invest in tech startups with social impact, by which we mean closing gaps. If you come, we've got more than two dozen ed tech companies in our portfolio. If you come to us with an ed tech uh, startup and your business model is you're going to sell your product to affluent parents who are nervous about their kids getting into college and here's some, something you can buy for them, forget it. Don't bother to pitch us. That is a gap widening company. So, but there are all kinds of clever ways to close those gaps of access and opportunity. What else do we fund? We fund things that democratize whole industries so that new entrants can come in. We invested early, early, early in Formlabs, the high resolution 3D printer. So what happens? Lots and lots and lots of people can now do, start their own businesses. Lots and lots of people can now compete with huge firms because they can do a 3D model and, com and submit it and be the architect who's going to design this school. They don't have to be part of a big firm with a $50,000 machine. It can be sitting on the kitchen table. So those are the two big categories we invest in. These are some of our companies. But let me say, you know that, uh, so I want to ask anybody who does investing out there, who's in your portfolio? 
Anybody else got 12 women that looks like this, CEOs? You might recognize on the lower left, Sue In, whose story we heard this morning. She's one of our cherished portfolio companies. Anybody else's portfolio look like this? That's what a meritocracy looks like. So I think our impact is only magnified. This isn't a pie to be split up. This is an explosion of impact waiting to happen when we build bridges across groups and when we look to include everybody who's underrepresented. Because then we begin to outnumber those folks that are in Vivek's Silicon Valley mafia. I love that term. Let's think about who the US population is, right? We, every time we walk in a room and we say, look, who's missing? It's all men. How come there are no women? Every time I want to ask you when next week and next month and next year, when you walk in a room and it's all white women, I want you to say, how come there's only white women here? Half the women in our country aren't represented in this room. Very soon, coming soon, no single racial ethnic majority. That means all of our audiences and groups ought to look like that. This was actually in the talk before. So there's Vivek's infamous quote on Twitter. I've lost tolerance for Silicon Valley's sexism and arrogance. That Twitter files for an IPO with all male board is outrageous. And I said, Vivek and Dick Costello, why no outrage that there are zero people of color on Twitter, on the Twitter board, since they're disproportionately high users? People of color, women and men of color, over index for use of Twitter, white women under index for use of Twitter. So if we're looking at who's their customer base, who's on it? There are many people who call it black Twitter, that there's a, a subgroup of. So we can do better and imagine what's going to happen when we do. Let's not just bring a few women entrepreneurs and investors into the Silicon Valley that exists. Let's definitely have critical mass and change the perspective. The goal here is to change the entire ecosystem. And in honor of <laughs> in honor of Nelson Mandela, who I think showed us all to live on a higher moral ground. Somebody described him as having a reflex of kindness. So let's all practice a reflex of kindness. Thank you.